All right, well, what's going on, man? Figured out. You've been back traveling, man. Cool. So just to give uh, everybody a little bit of context, um, I met Will because he walked up to me at Summer Shredding. I had, I hate to say it, I didn't know who he was at the time. And he came up and he knew my name, congratulated Megan on winning the Summer Shredding show. I felt so bad. I was like, who is this? I don't know who this is. And then I uh, followed you when we got back. I was like, dude, this guy's a savage. Like this guy's a savage. He's a competitor, but also I respected the fact that you walked up to me, you introduced yourself. And, um, you know, over the last couple of years, I, you know, you're someone that I've confided in, you know, sometimes when I'm having a hard time in business, I reach out to you and get your opinion. And you're someone I, I really look up to someone I, I get a lot of knowledge from and, uh, dude, I'm, I'm excited to have you here. So let's just start with your story. So like, wh who are you, where are you from? What are you all about? And let's start from the beginning. Yeah. I mean, at the very beginning, so my name is Old Jerome, for those of you who don't know, um, I was an online fitness coach. Uh, now I'm an online coach for coaches, very similar to Zach, we're in the same space. Uh, but I started out really skinny kid, wanted to play hockey, and my parents told me I wasn't big enough. And so I was like, all right, time to hit the gym. Hit the gym, got big enough, started playing hockey. And then when I went to college, I, I stopped. So I was like, I need something to kind of fill that void. That became a gym. And so I started coaching people, just random group classes. I had no idea like you could even be a personal trainer. I just started eventually throughout college, got my, got my certification and became like the go-to guy on campus for, for coaching. Um, and slowly figured out how to do the online thing. And over about like four years of doing online coaching, I got pretty successful at it to where I had more people asking me like, Hey, how do you, how do you do the business side of things versus like, I want to get abs. Mm -hmm. uh, so I slowly started pivoting into the, um, into the, the business coaching side of it. And then the last four years have been all that kind of creating systems and processes around. It, so. Yeah, I, I would definitely say that's your strong suit is uh, systems. Any Anytime I have a question, you're like, you should do this, this, and this. I'm like, dude, I didn't even think of that. <laughs> like your brain works in such an, uh, like a marvelous way. It's like, but yeah. where, where did you get that from? So in high school is when you started training for yeah. the gym for, uh, for hockey, right? What, what year was this? 20, up to 20. 10, okay. 2011. That's around the time when Instagram and just YouTube started. just started. And so what year were you in high school at this time? I was about a, so a sophomore. Sophomore? I wanted to play varsity, okay. play contact. Were you in, were you like in the, not you, I mean, obviously you weren't in the fitness industry, but you were, were you tapped in at all at that time? Like I had zero, no clue. Like yeah. I literally was like, oh, you just put, you put stuff on Instagram with like the sun filter. Yeah. And that's that's yeah. like what you do. I think my first post was like a sunset behind my YMCA. And I was like, the sun looks nice tonight. Like it was like, I had no clue at all that there was even an industry here. Yeah. Well, what's crazy is back then, dude, the online industry was, it didn't exist. It literally didn't exist. And, you know, I remember back 2010, 2011, I was looking at like, Stop, dude, am I going to have to be an accountant? Am I going to have to be a firefighter? Like those are the career opportunities that we had. There wasn't any like start your own business or anything like that. So when were you first introduced to the online space with fitness and how did you go about like deciding like, Hey, this is what I want to do rather than, you know, going to college or getting a job. So I actually, I got into like web design and stuff in, in college. Uh, and so the girl I was dating at the time, she was doing web branding and designing and we started building a business around that. Um, and she hopped into a couple different mentorship programs. And that's where I started to meet people who were like, oh, I have a coach for this and oh, I do this as well. And I was like, oh, there's more than just like designing website online. There's people who do ads, there's people who coach people on different things. And I started to get connected to all those different people while we were building this branding design agency. That was the first time my eyes were opened up to like, oh, there's like other ways to make money outside of like my job or my idea for a job is like, oh, I'll get a degree in finance and exercise science. And I'll be smart enough then about money to be able to actually have to launch a gym and make it successful. So like that was my... I, I go to plan. Yeah. I figured all this out. Once I, once I got connected to that first mastermind, I met a guy who ran a thing called the coaches cartel. And it was, you know, an online, uh, business for fitness coaches. Very similar to kind of like what we do now. I think he's since sold it, but he, you know, I hopped into his program and he was like, Oh, is it how you can set this up online? You send people Excel shit, price shoot and stuff like that. Don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, how you, that's like, old school. Yeah. Yeah. All this stuff. Yeah. So that was the first time I tapped into that. And that was like 20, 15, 2016, I think the, then that first kind of pivot because I've been training people up until then, but I think, like, like I said, like when like, I would email them stuff. Yeah. That was the first time I realized, Oh, there's an industry here. Yeah. I'd, I'd never seen before. Yeah. Well back then, um, the fitness dream was 
start a gym and start a clothing line or start a supplement yeah. line. Online coaching wasn't a, a platform for fitness trainers yeah. to be able to make money. Yeah. Um, but you said you joined your first mentorship with your girlfriend at the time. When was that? Was that, that was in college? In college, 2016, 2017. That was when mentorship was still pretty new. I remember getting on the phone with a couple of people, not even realized I was in a funnel. Yeah. Not yeah. even, didn't even know I was in like a sales process or anything like that. I thought the guy just wanted to help me. Exactly. And he's like, yeah, I have a $15,000 mastermind. And I was a, uh, a sophomore in college. And I was, or no, I was, a, I, sh I should have been a yeah. senior in college at the time, but I was really in my fourth year of community college. And I was like, what? what? <laughs> Dude, that's was like, like my entire college experience. I was like, people are charging $15,000 for this. I'm like, how is that even possible? And I didn't believe it at the time. So how did you take that jump with your first mentorship? Because at the in 2016, stuff was still new. So yeah. how did you get the courage and the balls to you know put the credit card on the line? Um, we, we were doing relatively well with the branding thing, and so we we would sell some website packages for like four or so k. And I actually didn't want to do it. Like she pushed me at the time. She was like, "You should do this." Like really, like you know, we're making it like a decent amount of money. And look, we were in college, so like our mm -hmm. bills were super low. I still, I worked for the school as a trainer. I worked as a barista at the same time. Like I wasn't doing all these different odd jobs to try to stack as much cash as possible. Um, but I was super risk averse. So I was like, I don't want to do it. And she really pushed me to be like, you'd be really good at this. Like you need to do it. And I think that the payment or something was like a thousand a month or something. It was not cheap. Yeah. To be honest, like the program was not good at all. Yeah. <laughs> like it was terrible, but it was enough to like get me some leverage. So, I mean, I, I honestly, like, I don't, take any credit for like having the balls to like put the credit card on the line. Like I literally was like my girlfriend at the time just pushed me. I was like, you can do this. And I was like, all right, cool. Like it was nice to have someone who kind of believed in me more than I believed in myself. Yeah. And that's something I tried to take into my coaching nowadays was I was like, that was a big kind of turning point for me. Like sometimes it just takes one person who believes in you a little bit more than you do yeah. to get you to take that action. So we tried to, I try to emulate that now for other people. Cause that, if it wasn't for that, I would never have started on this journey. Yeah, that's true. It, it is getting, it, important to have that, but sometimes like you gotta be that person for yourself too. That's true. I, uh, for my, for my journey growing up, my parents were very, very college, 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 college degree. And I remember I was having a, almost like an existential crisis where I launched my coaching business. I quit my job. I dropped out of school. I was making a few grand a month, but you know, the seasons come and you have it, you know, you get yeah. anxious and I call my mom and she's like, well, you know, you can always go back to school. You can always go get a job. Like you can always go back. And I was like, that didn't really help. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I cannot call my parents for support. I now am on my own and I have to, I have to blaze forward. Um, but this girlfriend that you're talking about, was this the same girlfriend that's not your wife? Yeah. Yeah. How did you guys meet? We met at college freshman year, freshman dance. Really? Yeah. yeah. I saw her. I was like, she's cute. Went across. I was like, Hey, you want to dance? Yeah. And Dan, Dan. Yeah, I kind of just went from there. Yeah. Water. And yeah. it sounds like she's pretty entrepreneurial. She is. Uh, she's crushing it in business. Yeah. She probably owns one of the top female entrepreneur businesses in the online space right now. That is incredible. I think you got lucky, man. I did. Yeah, yeah. Slight chance you just <laughs> asked this girl out. Dude, so where did she get it from and what have you learned from her? Yeah, I think for, for her, a lot of it was coming from like a much more tumultuous childhood. I had a very stable childhood. So like there wasn't necessarily that that feeling of like, I never experienced like true lack or scarcity and it didn't leave any scars on me. And so I had a much less urgent or much less like frantic approach to business, which can be good. But at the same time, she had this like insatiable hunger to be like, I never want to experience scarcity or lack like that again. So I'm going to, I'm going to grow so large and so successful that it's never even a possibility. Yeah. And you know, that kind of like voracious hunger for success is like one, it's inspiring to see. Um, and two, it like, it really is necessary if you want to get that next level. Like you have to have this almost like insatiable need for getting to the next level. And a lot of it is like, it's turning something that was probably a fear in the beginning mm -hmm. into like a superpower for yourself. Yeah. That, I mean, that from her, her was like, and being driving force. I think that, that really pulled me up. So I was always motivated and driven and like, I wanted to be highly successful, but I never had anything really underneath underpinning that, that was like driving me to be almost manic about it. And I think sometimes the people who are like the bet, they have a little bit of that and you can control it to be healthy, but it's always there where it's kind of this underlying blessing that, you, you know, you're this curse that you turn into a blessing. Yeah. Yeah. I always say that there's two, two drivers for motivation. You're either running away from something or chasing something. I think you got to have both. Yeah. I think you got to have both. So what is your dynamic like in a relationship since you're both entrepreneurs, you know, a lot of guys will have female girlfriends that are entrepreneurs as well. And sometimes it's a little 
you know, yeah. out of it for me and my girlfriend uh, or me and my wife. Yeah. We were both, in the, uh, we were both in the online space in the very beginning. It was, you know, not necessarily like a competition, but like, you know, she had a big month. I'm like, fuck, like I got, yeah. if I had a big month, she was like, fuck, right. Yeah. And, uh, we learned very early on to separate our businesses and work as a team in a relationship. But, um, you know, what was that like for you? It was interesting because the dynamic always like flowed. So, you know, there was times where like, I was working very heavily in her business. I wasn't working at all, like anything on my own. And there were times where once that became successful, I was working more on my own. Um, I think she was just always so far ahead of me that I was always hopelessly like, I will never catch you. Yeah. So I never even like got the chance to be competitive because I'm like, you are killing it. So I'm just like happy to, you know, do my thing and be able to like watch how you, we do a lot of stuff in this other business and then pull from that to put it into different businesses. Um, but sure, there's like, there's always a little bit of competitiveness. Um, but I think because we both started from zero together doing it and we built it from the ground up, it was like, you know, I realized that she's very strong in these areas. I'm very strong in these areas. And it was, you know, combining that that made it successful. And, you know, even though the brand and the face is hers, like being able to be like, hey, I was, you know, it was being able to build these back end systems and stuff and be able to see my ideas validated and come to life. Uh, it just kind of helped us be both like, okay, we're successful because we did this together. Yeah, and makes because, sense. You know, without one or the other, like who knows how successful or how different it would have looked. So I think if you, if, at least for us being able to start together, it took that competitive aspect out of it, but it's always there a little bit. You know, there's always a little bit of like, okay, cool. Like now I'm going to start something completely separate from that. Can I catch up? Can yeah. I, can I like get it to that same level? Yeah. But it's healthy. I don't find it too competitive. Well, yeah. And you guys have been together for quite some time now. So it's like, you know, what's mine is yours, what's yours is mine. That's, that's how being, getting married really let my guard down because in the very beginning I was very like, like I got to be successful. I got to do this. It was, I don't want to say I was super selfish, but I was more selfish with my time and with my resources than I am now. And now it's like, okay, we, I'm letting her in. I'm like, we are a team now. And it's, it's, it's great. It takes extreme vulnerability to like, let, th let someone in on your dream. It's like letting someone on your life is something, but like opening up and being like, Hey, like you're part of like my dream now and yeah. making this a reality. It's like, that's everything you have. So to let someone in and risk them being like, well, oh, I don't want this part of your dream anymore of that. It's like the most vulnerable you can be. But if it works out and you guys are aligned in that, then it's like, there's nothing more powerful than two people working on the same exact dream at the same yeah, time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think having a, a good, strong relationship is a key foundation for building, being a successful entrepreneur, just because it, it allows you to focus so much more. You're not distracted by going out and meeting yeah. people, you know, blowing money on tables, traveling, things yeah. like that. Um, and I know you recently just had your first daughter a couple yeah. years ago, correct? Yeah, Ellie. Yeah. What has fatherhood taught you about life? How has it helped you in business and entrepreneurship? Would you say that it's taken away? Would you say that it's added? What was that been like for you? I mean, it's going to sound cliche, but it's like, like literally every aspect of your life changes the minute like that little thing comes out. Like, that little baby is there. You're just like, oh my gosh, like this, this little thing has just completely changed every aspect of my life. And then watching them grow, like they develop personality, they become a little best friend of yours, you do stuff together, you have traditions together. Um, it just completely reorganizes any idea that you could possibly have had in your head of like, what are my goals or what am I working towards in a good way. And even before, you know, even before they're one and two, when you start to like see their personality come out, just the mere fact of like watching this life that you created come into the world and realizing that like this is now like your ultimate responsibility like all the businesses and other stuff you did is kind of like it's cool but it was kind of preparing you for this yeah it just changes something in you and you want to work 10 times as hard because it's now it's like this is gonna be a terrible analogy but it's gonna be like when you if you ever wanted a sports car really bad and you finally test drive the thing and it becomes real and you're like now i physically know what i'm working towards i've sat in it i've seen it i've yeah. touched it i've held it in my hands i know what i'm working towards it's like that but a thousand times more where it's like, oh, wow, this is like the physical embodiment of like my future, my family, and all this business stuff is cool. And a lot of those things I thought I was working towards and like materialism and stuff, awesome. But this is so far beyond any of that, that it's like your brain rewires. Like I really think it just changes almost like chemically how you think and how you act. Uh, I'm excited for it, man. So when it comes to parenthood, obviously you and your wife, what, what's her name? Maria. Way? You and Maria have taken the non-traditional path so what kind of 
how, how do you plan on raising Ellie? Are you going to push her to go to college and get a degree? Are you going to push her towards entrepreneurship? Like, what kind of values do you want to instill in her as parents that are entrepreneurs? Good question. So I want to give her option. I have no idea even like what college will look like in, you know, 16, 18 years. Like it's going to be, um, it'll be interesting. So we, I got open to 529 for her and we fund it and like, she'll have a full, like if she wanted to go somewhere, if she'll, she wants to take out loans or debt. Like I don't want to put her 10 steps behind starting out. So if she wants to go, it'll be there. But I really want to push her to be like, hey, I'm going to support you no matter what. And your mom and I are both proof that you can basically do whatever you want. And as long as you have an entrepreneurial mindset and you're willing to work hard, you can make that passion your career. And oftentimes it's going to be more lucrative or more fulfilling than you know going and getting some random degree. But I want to set it up in a way where if she's really like, I love the idea of being a lawyer and I want to go and go to law school. I'm like, this is all I want out of life. Then we have her set up in a way where I'm like, okay, cool. You're not going to end up broken and in tons of debt as well. So we're kind of setting it up both ways, but yeah, I want to, um, I want to just give her option too. And I want to be able to not have her go the traditional route. I think we're gonna try to do like private tutoring at home and stuff. And just, I feel like if you put them into the system, it just indoctrinates you so early and gets you into that like group employee thing that it's, it's hard. And I see other parents now that have kids, I kind of look at other parents and their kids and what, what's going on in their lives. And I can see that like subliminal messaging, it's like taking over their kids and their personality as they grow up and it scares me because I'm like, I don't ever want to like feel like I lost my kid because I threw them somewhere eight hours a day to have a better work-life balance and mm-hmm. not realizing that I was like just sending them off to be like completely rewired a different way than like how I would have raised them. So yeah, it, does, it raises a bunch of questions, which, you know, she's two, so I'm still figuring yeah, out exactly you got, how. You got a couple more years. Yeah, yeah. I would say I've got like a loose plan and a lot of worries yeah. at this point. Yeah. So hopefully I'll flip that to more plans and less worries as it goes on. But what kind of what kind of values and skills do you want to instill in Ellie that you think are missing from adults today? Promote. So I think I think work ethic is just one of the main ones where it's you know especially she'll come from a family that has a decent amount of money I and mean, I don't want her to ever be one of these like trust fund kids who they get paid a certain amount every month and they never work and they're like oh I can just kind of like. And influence her on this. I, I don't hate for her to do that. I want her to, um, I forget who said it. It could have been, uh, I think it was Ed Milet talked about how he wanted his kids to have a service based job and a sales based job before they went off to school. So I want to do something the same for her where I want to get the, um, the entrepreneurial skill set just ingrained in her enough where she tries things that she has hobbies or passions she wants. I'll get behind it and I'll help her, but I also want her to go and do a job where she's in a service position having to deal with people. And also do a job where she's in a sales position, having to, you know, have, you know, transactional conversations with people, understand this. I feel like no matter what you go into, then after that, having those skill sets developed at an early age are transformative. It yeah. puts you at a different national odds than any other, you know, any other kids coming up from traditional education. Um, that, and then I think just like good, wholesome, like we're Christians. So like yeah. whatever, good, wholesome Christian values where it's like, you've got a good sense of self-worth. You understand you're valuable. You, know, you understand that your decisions have impacts and consequences. I don't want to be some like overbearing, like you do this, 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 but I want her to just be like, yeah, I have a lot of self love and respect for myself. And so I'm going to make decisions that I like align with that because I'm not looking for a quick fix. And hopefully like the way her parents live, it'll, it'll kind of show her that like, this is probably a smart way to make decisions. Yeah. I, um, I obviously I haven't had kids yet, but I, I think about it all the time and the things that I'm most excited for teaching my kids, the things that I felt I was lacking as, as a teenager going into adulthood that could have served me, that if I had these skills as, as a kid, it would have you know, changed the trajectory of my life is number one, personal finance, understanding, you know, taxes as even as a teenager it could be, you know, transformative, understanding investing, understanding, you know, just saving money and being smart with it um, and socializing, learning right. how to talk to strangers, learning how to have conversations with people you know, that you don't know or learning how to walk up to people, um, which I think goes into the, the sales job. But I think that if you understand finance, personal finance, and if you understand how to communicate with other human beings, it doesn't matter what field you go to. Number one, you'll find success. Number two, you'll be happy. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really key point too, is socialization, especially if you do a more like private tutoring route. Like yeah. it was, I was homeschooled the latter half of like um, my like elementary years, like, like sixth grade on, I was homeschooled. And so I had to like really fight to find places to socialize because you can end up a little weird and awkward like, Yeah, you are yeah. integrated. Um, so I think, yeah, that's a, it's an underutilized skill, like proper socialization where it's like learning how to talk to people about ideas 
versus like people and things. Yeah. They're actually having like substantive conversation and what it's like to like, Hey, if your friends don't talk about this, like here's how you can start creating these conversations with them, being good at conversation, starting, being good at getting people to open up. I think is a massively underrated skill. Yeah. Let's uh, switch gears. Let's talk about, you know, your first business. So what was your first business that you started that was on your own? Uh, was it fitness coaching? Was that your, yeah. was that the first business? Tell me about that. How did you get into that? What would, what were the first, you know, 12 months like? And, uh, you know, fill me in. Yeah, it was a very slow, it was years of kind of building into it. I kind of fell into it. So I, would, I was working odd jobs at the time. I was in barista, worked as a, as a clerk at like a grocery store. And um, I really kind of started in college. I just missed the, the group workouts. I was a team captain for hockey. So I, like, I ran the practices. I was used to kind of like running these group workouts, putting the guys through the measures. And I loved that. And so when I went to college, I kind of just informally started this thing called... Um, thought it was called hell week, but like we would have like workouts every week. And then the fourth week of every month, like most of the guys would do it in a group with us. Mm -hmm. And the whole month had been building towards like this massive high volume end of year, like end of month week. And the leg day was on the Friday. We'd all go get food afterwards. I would just fill these guys on the leg day. Mm -hmm. It was like, make a man out of you kind of stuff. And it became so popular. I ended up having like 20 to 30 people. And the school was like, can you just like become a head trainer for the gym and like start doing this underneath like the school's umbrella. Cause then basically you are acting like a trainer. I yeah. <laughs> need you to get a certification, like do it under the school's guidance. So I did, I ended up getting the certification and I was in person. Like I had no clue you could do stuff online. And my problem was when you're in person, you run the front desk, you're at a small school and there's not many trainers, infinite lead flow. So like everybody came through wanted to work with me. I immediately was out of time. I got into like 30 or 40 in-person clients and I was like, guys, I have like classes. I got other stuff. I'll just start sending you things online. Like I'll email you the workout. You can follow along or do it at your own pace. And so I kind of just informally out of necessity started to figure out what the online coaching piece was. It wasn't for another like two years until I really started to actually take it seriously and be like, oh, there's an app that I can set up. Like I can give you guys an app. I can actually put stuff on here. Um, well, probably like yeah. a few years until an app was available. Yeah. Was, I remember when I started online, Trainerize wasn't a thing. No. TrueClick was, wasn't a thing. It was, what was the, for me, it was Google Excel. I mean, it's something like PT Distinction, I think. I do remember that briefly. It yeah. was like the first one on the scene. Yeah. I, remember, I used that for a really long time. And then I switched to Trainerize. But I, I mean, it was like, it wasn't like, there was so, it was so unestablished at the time. It wasn't like I can really track like the first 12 months. It was kind of like I became this, this in-person trainer. I just happened to get enough clients that I've maxed out my schedule. And I started to play around with like, well, here's online. I created um, a couple of eBooks and stuff where I gave you like, Hey, I'm just going to put the entire workouts that we do in an eBook and you can follow along. And then if you want to come to the gym and do it with us, like we'll be there doing it. Um, but in those first couple of months, like there was no, I was also in college. I wasn't thinking, Oh, this is going to be my career. I was like, this is good practice for me. I mean, this will help me run a gym better in while I'm getting this degree. Um, yeah. I would say, you know, three, four K a month on average is what we would make. I didn't even really track the numbers. I was just like, as there's probably half the people, I don't think we're even paying me. I think I would just think, oh, you don't, you don't, can't afford it. We'll just come anyway. Like, yeah. yeah. It's a group training program. So it was very loose. I didn't really start to regiment it towards like the latter half of college. And I was like, oh, I'm going to graduate and I could probably like use a job. Like I'm going to need some money. Maybe if I take this seriously, I could actually do this as like my main source of income. But that didn't happen until like the third year I was doing coaching. Was there any, you know, fear and uncertainty around the time in college? Because I remember when I was going to college, I was a scared kid. I didn't know what my future was going to look like. I didn't know what I was going to do as a career, pay the bills. I had this dream of being a fitness influencer and I was working for is that busting tables, but I knew I had a very short window. I was 20, 20 21, 22. My friends are college are graduating college from a year and I'm still busting tables. I'm like, dude, I am an anxious wreck. Um, so was there any uncertainty about that when you were a kid or, or I was wish like? there was more. I yeah. think I was the opposite. I was blissfully ignorant. I was just like, I was like sold. So like, oh, you're gonna graduate, you'll get an internship, you'll land a job, like they'll be solid. And I was like, oh, cool, I can do all that. And then like in all those other extra hours that I'm totally gonna have in the day, like I'll just keep doing the fitness coaching thing. And um yeah, maybe I'll do corporate for a year or two and then I'll watch the business. I'll watch the gym. Yeah. So I was just blissfully ignorant. Like I just didn't, I didn't even take the time to think like, oh, this might not work out. I was so like drinking the Kool-Aid or like the college was the end all be all that I was like, oh, I'll just graduate and big job will be sitting there and they'll pay me a ton of money. It yeah. also give me enough free time to like run everything. But I didn't realize it was like all my lead flow. It came from being the front desk guy yeah. at college. Like the minute you're not sitting at the front of a gym with a new person coming in every 30 minutes on the hour, like to sign up for your stuff you were relying on like social media, which I hadn't pushed that hard. I mean, I had like a couple thousand followers on Instagram, but like it wasn't like I could 
immediately pivot. And so the minute I, like I left college, that's when the anxiety hit. I left, I got an internship and I realized really quickly, I'm like, dude, I hate this. Mm -hmm. Like I'm sitting under fluorescent lights all day long. I have no time for this other business. I also am like, I, how the heck do I sign a client? Yeah. I'm like, I have no, like all of a sudden I was like, well, no, there's no way for me to get people. Like, where are they? Like, I need to be in a gym or like, I had to go and like hit up all my friends on Facebook from college and be like, hey, do you want to do like the online thing now? I had no other concept of it. So the anxiety for me hit post-graduation when I got at the real world. And I was like, this sucks. Yeah. Um, and then I, I was in corporate for two years by doing that and doing the, the fitness training on the side um, while at the same time, like really pouring most of my effort into my wife's business because that was the one that was taking off. And so I was mm -hmm. kind of like, well, if I backburner this a little bit, this is just like really not working right now. I'll do the nine to five for like the benefits and stuff for a family. And then I'll, I'll, you know, spend my extra hours helping her grow this side of the business. And so that after college really fell off and took me back for her scene. It was almost like I had this like two year hiatus where I was like depressed in this corporate job, kind of like feeling that beat down of, man, like, what if we don't make it out of this? This is 40 years that I'm stuck here. Yeah. And I had this like, this is the dream I've been sold. Yeah. yeah. I had this coming to Jesus moment where like one of the, one of the women who was like a pillar at the company had a retirement party. She talked about how she'd been there 45 years and it was like this really crappy little speech in the cafeteria. And I'm like sitting there with like my tray of food, like I'm back in elementary school, watching this woman talk about her 45 years she gave the company and they gave her like a little goodie bag. And then she was like leaving that day and that was it. Wow. And I was like, dude, that cannot be the culmination of 45 years of work. Yeah. Like that's what I'm working towards. I was like, I need to get out of here. And that's like, so that I think sunk a lot more panic and anxiety. I, so I, I back end loaded it. I was like super happy go lucky through all the college. And then two years of corporate, I was just a mess. Yeah. You, you had to separate the real world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then how did you get the business off the ground? So honestly, it was a mix of, so I was able to kind of do a little bit online with, like I said, with Facebook, which but that's really what I got good at was I, I learned Facebook groups, right. which helped a lot. That's how I was able to acquire most of my clients. And then going back through my contact list, knew a lot of like, I mean, the stuff that fitness coaches hate to do. Dude, the cold hour. Oh stuff. my God. I'm like, this is how you get your business off the ground. And my first 10 K month was legitimately me going through all of the online coaches or uh, online coaches, all of the um, old friends from college and being like, Hey, like, dude, I love training you in college. I've got this new thing. I'd love for you to take a look at it. Would you mind hopping on a call? Like, it wasn't even a sales pitch. I was just saying, I've got created some new workout thing. Would you hop on a call and look at it? And then I would show them and be like, what would you add? What would you take away from this? We called it like, I ended up branding this like a market research call where you, mm -hmm. you get people on to help you give feedback on the program. And at the end, you kind of ask if they'd be down to do it for a discount. I did that and I signed like, like 10 or 12 clients for around like a thousand dollars for the program. And so that made me right around 10 K. And then I was like, oh, okay, this is how I'm going to do it. Um, and then I used that to hop into some more programs, learn some more about stuff. And then I was also mirroring at the time, Maria, her business started to pop off. That started doing 20, 30, 50 K a month. And I was watching how she was feeding everything from groups organically still, like we hadn't touched ads. And so I started doing the same strategy and that started feeding more into my business from the, from the organic Facebook group side. And together at that point, I was like, I'm making more than I'm making in my corporate job. You are making like 20 times more than I'm making in my corporate job. Why, why are we still in Delaware on these coasts? cold rainy season like what's but delaware is tough dude dude it's like yeah it's they're suppressing like half yeah. year. <laughs> that's crazy is that where you grew up yeah, yeah. Did, so i lived in ashburn for a year okay. uh so i grew up in salinas california which is around an hour south of san francisco then i moved to san diego which was life-changing loved it uh had you know uh, come to jesus moment where i was like i don't know what i'm doing with my life i need to launch this online business i got an opportunity to move to virginia for a year and i spent that year um building my business i had no car i was out i was in a rural area it was literally me and my best friend on a laptop in a basement and it, i remember going through delaware i'm like man this place sucks <laughs> this place, this, <laughs> you go through for like five minutes like that was like cool i think there was like a bridge that yeah, was like the that's all yeah <laughs> like, a, like a bridge that was i'm like oh this bridge is kind of cool but yeah it's good so what do you think um because i always say that if you're a fitness coach up and coming and your dream is to go online as fast as possible the absolute best thing that you can do is get in the best shape of your life move to a studio next to the beach and just get sick content yeah. at the beach uh, in just a sunny place that people want to be that's going to get a lot of attention how would you say moving from delaware to california affected your life your happiness your business and what were the positives what were the negatives what was that like and how, how would you yeah. like what what's your opinion on your environment shaping you know it's huge 
I would say I remember the the last the last year I was in Delaware. I literally remember actually like crying the first sixty degree day we had. I didn't realize how seasonally depressed I was mm-hmm. until like I remember stepping outside of my apartment one of those days. And it was the first day we're like sixties out here. Everyone's like that's cold. There it's like you're it's like thirty degrees, thirty degrees and cloudy. And it was the first day, probably in like two months, the sun had broken through the clouds, and it was warm and sixty degrees. And I like felt the sun on my skin. And I literally started crying. I had no idea why, and I was just like this cannot be healthy. Yeah. And it was just after we decided kind of like, Hey, we're going to pick up and move this summer. Um, and, and get out of, get out of here. We're not doing another winter here. And I think it was kind of that realization, like I'm going to be in a place that's more aligned with like who I want to be and what I want to do. Um, but even just from like a, like a seasonal depression standpoint, made it a massive change, but also from like the people I was around, like nowadays when I go to the gym, you know, I got memberships at all the local, like kind of like mecca gyms Mm -hmm. and i'm constantly surrounded by people who are deep in the fitness industry doing you know doing what i love to do building on big ideas i'm constantly surrounded by people who are talking about massive ideas to change the industry that i'm in whereas back home it was my friends the local bar and and nothing and so Mm -hmm. i think that changing environment is huge when it pushes you because you're kind of like any kind of old patterns you have are disrupted now. You're like, I have to go create a new pattern. So if you move, then you move during a time where you're intentionally kind of stepping into like, it's like monk mode. Yeah. Kind of like, I'm going to really drive to like actually grow this business and take it seriously. All the new habits and patterns you've set up in that new place uh, are much like healthier. So you end up with a new environment and an entirely new cycle of habits that are more aligned with your goals. And then if you happen to also make that place somewhere, it's like, you're willing to pay a little extra, but it's a place that's nicer it fits the it fits the vibe of like what you want to be you're kind of like future pacing your reality being like hey this is what i want my life to be like from here on out and even if it's tight even if i can barely afford it right now it's worth pushing yourself one because it'll elevate you to achieve that level of success to be able to stay there and two because that is where the majority of people who are doing what you want to do living the life you want to live are and the sooner you surround yourself with them the sooner you're able to learn from them collaborate with them um and uh, just be around that energy, which I think is in, it's an intangible that's super important. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say with full confidence, I would not be who I am or where I am if I didn't move to San Diego. I I do believe that you can bulldoze your way into success no matter where you are. You can pay to get into masterminds. You can fly to certain cities and meet certain people, but it's going to be slow and it's going to be you know a lot of uphill work. Whereas if you just align yourself with where those people are. And you can make it convenient to get in their circles. And you grow so much faster. Like I, I will say, I, I feel like I got lucky uh, moving to San Diego when I did because I got to get connected with Kendall Strample, who I learned so much from. Uh, Brooklyn Hillebrand, who you know I learned a lot from. Uh, Nick Comedina, and so many more people that were just happened to be in San Diego, and I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. And uh, or Lexi De Young too, who yeah, unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. Lexi was one of the first people that sat down with me. I was in call. I was busting tables. I had worked out with Lexi a couple of times and I saw that she was doing online coaching. She just graduated. I said, Hey, Lexi, can I pick your brain on what, on what you're doing? And she da- sat down with me and showed me everything that she's doing and, and literally taught me how to get started with online coaching. And if it wasn't for her, I'm like, dude, if I didn't have that connection, like there's no one doing that in my hometown. Like yeah. that, it changed my life forever. So after we left San Diego, we've been here because we wanted to, you know, uh, upgrade, you know, get a bigger house, but also save money at the same time. Now that we've been here for two years, me and Megan are like, dude, we were happier broke in San Diego, filled with beautiful people, more so than being here with a lot of nice things, but lacking a community. Like we have a few really solid friends here, but we're like, we got to get to Austin. We got to get to where the people are because I'd rather be surrounded by, you know, people that I enjoy seeing every single day that I can learn from that are pushing the needle rather than sitting on a stack of cash by yourself. Yeah. There's no joy in that. I think too, once they go, I think a lot of people, because they're in a survival state, they're kind of like, Oh, like money's going to solve all my problems. And it's like, it will solve all your survival problems. But that's like, once you've covered that and you're like, Oh, like I don't worry anymore about like where food's getting paid for or, or rent or housing or all that. And like my future is looking pretty taken care of now. The minute you cover that, you realize like, oh, there's this whole other set of needs that I have that just, I was so caught up in like almost the trauma of like getting through the survival piece that you were neglecting them. And then they come back to the surface. Once you're there, you're like, oh, like I want friends. I want community. Yeah. I want purpose. This, these are the things back. that matter. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like the minute you get out from the survival state, those things now boil to the surface. And you're like, 
oh my gosh, like I had no time to worry about that when I was like, how am I going to like pay for groceries this week? But now that I am set, I want this deeper, richer, more meaningful life. But all these really complex questions come to the surface. And there's a mix of guilt too, which is like, why am I feeling like this when I'm making more money than ever? Like I should be grateful for everything I have. I shouldn't be having all these deep philosophical existential questions yeah. about my reality, but it's just a byproduct of being like, okay, cool. You solved for like level one, level two problems. You got more money. You're going to have more problems that come up and you're going to have more of these kind of like deeper questions. Be like, okay, there's got to be more than just making more. Yeah. The minute you make, you know, a couple thousand dollars a month, you can cover your bills. Anything that you add on incrementally from that. Like I know people who make a hundred thousand dollars a month. I know people who make 10, their quality of life really doesn't change. And in fact, you can actually see an increase if you get up to like 100, 200K per month because it, it creates a lot of bigger questions that you now have to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot more fires too. Yeah. And you have this kind of like, you go through this cycle of like up leveling who you are as a person and be like, oh man, I'm responsible for a lot now. I, I have to kind of sharpen myself as a tool to be able to handle all this. Yeah, that's funny that you say that because um, I remember when I was starting P2BI, I was making around 10, 15 grand a month as a fitness coach. And my roommate at the time were also making 10 to 15 grand as a fitness coach. And, you know, we had very similar lifestyles. And then I started P2BI and it really took off really quick. You know, by the end of the year, when we were still living together, I was now making hundred grand a month. He was making 15 grand a month. And he was like, kept trying to force himself to like get into the online thing or do something bigger, do something bigger. I remember he had a conversation with me. He was like, dude, like I, I find myself comparing myself because you're in, you know, working, and I'm watching TV and I'm like, dude, you have such a good setup. You're making 10 to 15 grand a month. You're 23, 24 years old. You train clients until 10 a.m. And then you go play golf all day. That is like, you have freedom. You have free and I'm like, if you look at her, like we live in the same apartment, we drive the same car. We both have beautiful girlfriends. We hang out with the same friends. We do the same thing. We have identical lives. The only difference is you choose to spend your time doing something you enjoy. And what I enjoy happens to be work, yeah. right? I don't enjoy playing golf. He took me out golfing one time. I literally got sick by the 18th hole. <laughs> I, I went home, passed out because I, I got sick. And I'm like, I don't enjoy playing golf, but you love golf. I love work. So like at a certain point, like certain money only allows you to have the free time to do what you love. Yeah. Yeah. I, so now that you're at this level and you've had all of your basic level one needs met, what have you found to be the things that are actually worth it and the things that aren't necessarily worth it? I think one is definitely, you said it's time. Mm -hmm. And part of that can suck because you can realize that you just built something that makes you a ton of money, but takes up the majority of your time. And now all you want is your time back. Mm -hmm. And so you can recreate the exact money trap that you're aiming or the time for money trap that you're aiming to get out of by growing the wrong structure. Um, so for me, one of the things I realized was like, I did a huge restructure the past two years and how we do business to where I'm like, I can run this and still have plenty of time for my family. Cause like, that's the number one thing that I found was like, I had like the sports car for a while. And I loved that. And I was like, totally all about that. And I'm going to get some more and I'm going to build this huge garage out of them. When I had my daughter, like, I don't know, just something flipped a switch. And I was like, all I really care about is like, I want to spend time with you. Mm -hmm. It's like one of my company policies is, uh, Wednesdays are daddy daughter days. Mm -hmm. One, it was a good way to test how the company runs without me in it. Um, but two, it was like self shit for me to be like, I want to make sure I have like a full day where I can just like do stuff with Ellie. Um, so I take off, my team handles the slack, they handle the calls, they handle the fulfillment and they know not to ping me the whole day. And that to me, being able to restructure to where I had a team who was working with me who still loves their jobs, everyone's incentives are aligned with what they want to do. But it also at the same time provided me the freedom to be like, hey, even on like a middle of a work week with stuff going on, with fires happening in the business, I've got enough people now to handle this where I don't have to, I don't have to be in the business at all. And I can have that free time with my family. That immediately became the most valuable piece for me. And so now I'm addicted to that. I want to see how big can I grow this without sacrificing any of that time freedom? Because the last thing I'd ever want to do, I talked to a couple, a couple guys in my space who, you know, are older and then they've had kids. And then the one thing they said was like, whatever you do, like don't get caught up in chasing like the growth of the business over the time with your family right now, because they, you're only going to have young kids for like a very small amount of time. Like it's not even like you're going to have kids for 18 years. Like you have, you have young kids for like four or five years. Yeah. Well, you only have a two year old once. Yeah. For exactly. one year. You only yeah. got a two year old for one year. And they're a different person every year. And you think, yeah. don't miss that because you're convinced, oh, I got to work harder for their future. Mm -hmm. like, they won't like you in the future if you weren't there for the present. Yeah. Like, shoot, they have that how they. Yeah. I had a, I had a season where, you know, I went from being broke, being broke, being broke, being broke and scared to now I have a fuck ton of money in my bank account. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go get all the things that I, I've always wanted to. 
And uh, it created more stress, more problems because when you earn the money that's in your bank account and then you go spend it, yeah. now you don't have the money, the money in your in bank, bank account. account. Yep. And now you're <laughs> fucking stressed. And you know, no regrets. I love this. This watch was one of the things that I bought. Absolutely love it. I love the Corvette. But the things that really matter are the fact that I get to go into the gym at 8 a.m. when I want to with my best friend and make content. I get to clock out of work at four o'clock on days that I want to. I get to watch a movie with Megan and know that like, hey, we're good. I'm not stressed. We can watch a movie and I could fully be in the moment. I'm not stressed about anything outside of just spending my time with Megan. Um, I, I don't take calls on Monday. Someone was like, why don't you take calls on Monday? Because I'm like, I get Sunday scaries. Yeah. I have calls on Monday. So I just said no calls on Monday. And having that freedom, dude, I can have that at 10K a month. Yeah. And that is the freedom that really changes your life. Yeah. That's Those are the things that I think are worth it. Yeah. I think too, I think more people need to hear that. Yeah. Because I think a lot of people, because now in our, our space, especially too, it's like, well, a lot of the marketing's like, my client made this much. And the next coach is like, well, my client made this much. And it's like, that's cool. It doesn't equate to happiness or fulfillment or like Dude, a get, full-time job. Get this. I, uh, I'm in a couple, I'm in a couple masterminds as like a, I say like a spy. Yeah. They bring me, they bring me in and, uh, you know, the competitor, competitor's business. Right. Yeah. But I help out because I love helping. Like I love teaching. It doesn't matter if it's my students, your students. Like I, I want, I want to share. Um, so I'm, I'm in another person's mastermind and on their, uh, Instagram story, they're like, yeah, this person just hit hundred K months. And then on in the mastermind, that same person who just hit 100K a month is like writing, uh, like, like letting it all out, how stressed out they are. Yeah. Their overhead is expensive. They're barely above water because, you know, their team structure is all fucked up. And I'm like, dude, more money does not equal more happiness. Yeah. And a lot of times, too, it's like when we do testimonials, I've got a rule in our program and I'll make people rewrite stuff if we're going to screen clip it, mm -hmm. where um, you're only allowed to share what you made in cash collected that month. I do that. I'm the same way. I don't, yeah. people are like, I had a 15K month. I'm like, is it cash collected? They're like, yeah. no, I'm like, you did. I do yeah. cash collected is the only thing that matters. So like you could spend $20,000 in ads to make $50,000 in sales and collect $5,000, $6,000 that month. You yeah. can be super negative, but you can flip it to look any which way. And I'm so sick of that because I've so many never, coaches yeah. are like, Oh, this guy's making 100K. I'm like, no, he's making 20K this month. Yeah. He has $20,000 in ads. He has $20,000 in his team. Um, you know, and he's, he's only making, you know, this much, right? Like the numbers yeah. are not what they look like. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big cash collector guy. I don't, I don't care about revenue because, dude, you can't, you can't bank on future earnings. Yeah. yeah it doesn't, that doesn't help it, you with the this month. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't. Uh, you can't bank on future earnings. What have you found to be the sweet spot on income? 20 or 30K. Yeah. That's actually, so I've actually really pushed back on a lot of coaches now, even um, people with like ad spend, because a lot of them are like, oh, IGDM ads crushing it, follower ads crushing it. Uh, but with with our coaches, we do a lot of playbooks. So I'm like, hey, I've worked with like 350 or so coaches right now. I've gone full time online working with us. And I'm just really close with all that. Like, we have a really good relationship. So they send me stuff I'm like, hey, these are like the messaging scripts that work for us. Or this is like really good books. So this has always performed well for me. And we just turn them into these massive playbooks. We're like, hey, instead of me just like teaching you, like this is what you could do. Like, here's what you should do. But here's also like a playbook of how it's worked for like over like 100, so 300 coaches. These are the exact things they've used. We try to keep it as up to date as possible. But using just that and doing it organically tends to get these coaches to 20 or 30K. So just patient. I'm like, dude, give it six months. Don't quit. Don't stop posting don't feel like you have to run ads yet just do this playbook do the hard stuff for six months on average that gets our coach between 20 and 30k and they seem extremely happy there because yeah. it's not a, a lot of operational strain and the only thing then is like okay now when you run ads we're not trying to get to 100k per month we're just trying to take all that all the work that you're doing right now with cold outreach and take it from outbound to inbound so yeah. now the ads bring those leads into you and you can convert them and fulfill them mm -hmm. and then it's like, well, you can kind of step away from the business. But what happens is if you step away from the business and you start managing at around 20 to 30K, you're going to bring in some coaches, you're going to bring in some sales teams. Those people are incentivized. If you structure the business correctly, they're incentivized to build the business. So they're going to start pushing you to grow the business and they'll make sure that they handle the headaches because mm -hmm. they know, hey, he doesn't want the headaches of 100K all on his back. If you can go properly structure your business now. Your coaches, your sales team, your setters will grow the business for you to 100K while also making sure that it's in a way that you feel like you're not the one shouldering all the burden. Mm -hmm. But that 20 to 30K piece organically 
a lot of coaches just think you, you have to pay for ads to get there. You can get there organically given six months. And then you start with such an amazing base for ads. Yeah. You have the money to blow where you're like, I lose 5k on ads. Like it's like a couple percent of like one of my months or yeah. Or for a new coach, they're like, dude, that's like all I have saved up in my bank. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I agree with you. I think 20 to 30 K is a sweet spot for like, for like income. Cause it's just enough to where you have enough free time to kind of choose and delegate your schedule and do what you want and, and outsource what you don't want to do to coaches. Yeah. Uh, but it's not so crazy to where you're stressed out all the time. There's a bunch of overhead, a bunch of clients, you know, charging yeah. back, things like that. Yeah. And two, I think people don't understand like the, the way a business structure works is like you have two metrics that really just determine how a business runs. It's cost to acquire a customer and client lifetime value. How much that client will spend with you over time. Most coaches don't realize the minute you jump into like the ad game and stuff, you're now paying, you're only having this like constant hamster wheel. Like you have to pay to get people in the front door. And that cost can be more expensive or less expensive some months. Like it's an election year. Mm-hmm. And it's really expensive because all the politicians buy the ad spots. And so there's less spots to buy. So they cost more. It's like we're digital real estate. Mm-hmm. There's a whole other world here. So if you can get clients without doing that, you can acquire them for zero cost. And so like I had a client, she was an in-person trainer for like a self-made facility. And she had a $32,000 a month. And she said it was half online, half in person. It's great. I really didn't increase the amount of hours I'm working at the gym, but I like tripled my income. Is mm-hmm. it? And on top of that, she's like, I, I was like, how much did you take home? She's like, 30,000 to the 32. I paid 2000, like my videographer. And that's my only expense aside yeah. from like trainerized. And it's like, that is, that's nice. where you want to be. That's at. nice. Because yeah. I know coaches who make around hundred K who also take home 30 K per month. Yeah. Like you just increased your problems, you know, three X and you didn't increase any of the money you took home. So you're just, you're basically getting paid the same to handle three times the work. Yeah. And so if you go slow and you do the right structure, you can make a hundred K per month and bring home 70 or 80. If you do it the right way and you're patient, but if you rush, sure, you can bolster off that, that number in your ego, but you pay for it in the inefficiency in the model. Yeah. I know, uh, you, you probably experienced this with some of the coaches that you work with. We work with a lot of beginners who are starting from scratch yeah. and we really have to instill for them like dude, six to 12 months. That's what you need. And you know, the system is pretty dialed in now. Like everyone knows, you know, the things that work in the online space, the things that don't work in the online space. I always tell them the difference between someone who's making 10 grand a month versus a person who's making 50 grand a month is that they've just been doing it for longer yeah. and they have more client retention and they have a roster base like Francis, who, who you met last night, he's doing around 50 grand a month. He has almost 200 clients. They only, and he's only spending what, like six, six or, so. six or yeah. so, something in ads. And he only started ads last year. But the difference between him and someone who's, you know, making five to 10 grand a month is that. Francis has just been doing it for four years and has retained his clients throughout the years. So it's like really just a rinse and repeat process. And I feel like a lot of coaches get shiny object syndrome and they join a program, they learn what works, they get, you know, five, 10, 15 grand a month. And then they try all these other things that detour them from the thing that actually was. So what do you, what do you think in terms of like patience instilling that into coaches? Like what, what are the discipline habits that you think are important for coaches to adopt? I think it is just a mindset. It's a mindset thing. I think the easiest way that I've been able to communicate is I always, I talk to fitness coaches, how fitness coaches would talk to their clients. I'm like, you guys get this when you tell your clients this and you don't realize that you break all your own rules when it comes to your business. Mm -hmm. If you had a client who wanted to, you know, you wanted to hit a hundred K month is like a client wanted to drop a hundred pounds, right? It's a big goal. Mm -hmm. It's not, I want to hit a 10 K month. I want to drop 10 pounds. When you have a massive goal like that, you're not going to look at that client and be like, here's all the quick fixes you're going to do. We're going to start with the green tea detox, and then we're going to do some of these special minerals, uh, and you're going to wear a waist trainer, and then in 30 days, you're going to be there. Like You would just never tell them that. You'd be like, Anyone who tells you that's lying to you. The problem that most of you do is you get on the treadmill, and you do your first cardio session, and you look in the mirror, and you're not down 100 pounds. In fact, you're not even down one pound. You just did the first daily discipline. Mm-hmm. And it's getting them to say, you need to take the same mindset towards building this business that your hundred pound client takes towards losing that weight. That, that right there is the reframe that most of them need. Mm-hmm. And then if you can label all, if you can basically tell them, like we have a list of scams that you are going to get presented as an online fitness coach. I have a little document I give them. And I was like, these are all things that are going to pop up. I just want to give it to you ahead of time. That is so smart, dude. That is so yeah. smart. And I was like, you don't need this agency. You don't need this software yet. And, and I tell them too, like, these things are fantastic and you do need them. Here's when you need them in the business structure. So they, it, it paints them this roadmap of um, everything is good and everything will work at a certain time when you're in a certain situation. Mm-hmm. 
none of that works right now for you. You just need to do these things. And then once you're here, I'll help you. Like, you don't have to buy it from us. You can buy it from anyone you want, but I'll tell you what it is that you need at this next step. Mm-hmm. So I think one is reframing the mindset so that they look at it like, okay, someone's going to lose a hundred pounds today. It's like a one to two year thing. Mm-hmm. I need to approach my business the same way. Over one to two years, I could set up my business to probably make 50 to hundred K per month. Now that you have that mindset, then you have to say, okay, cool. What are the pitfalls that would stop my hundred pound client? What could derail them? They're doing good. They're three months in. Oh, they got, you should be doing carnivore diet or you should be um, doing this detox method. What are these shiny objects that can pull them away? And just calling them out and educating them on these exist. This is what they're going to tell you. This is the promise they're going to make to you. And here's why it won't work here, but here's where it will work later. It allows them to, you're not saying no to them. You're just saying no for now and maybe yes for later. Mm-hmm. It creates that, we call it vision painting. That that vision now is much more clear for them. They know the obstacles ahead. And then I'm just like, okay, now it's on you. Are you going to actually lock it and do this or not? Because I, mean, I can't do it for you, but I can tell you this is the expectation you have to have. This is the things you have to avoid. Are you ready to put in the work on that time of type of like time horizon? And that's why I made such a close knit, like high level team. Cause most people aren't, most people see that and they're like, I don't like that. You didn't promise me it in 90 days. I'm like, yeah. ever going to. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm the same right. way. We, we don't, we don't, not that we don't, we guarantee that the system will work, but it completely depends on yeah. the coach on how far they'll take it. Yeah. yeah. It's like, hey, we can we can guarantee that this system will work and you'll get clients, but it is totally up to you on how far you're willing to take it. Yeah. Some people only want to take it to three to four or five grand a month. Some people want to take it to 50 grand a month. That is completely dependent on the coach. Um, what are some of the mistakes that you see fitness coaches that are doing five, 10, 15 grand a month, solopreneur on their own, but they got to figure it out. Yeah. They want to scale. What are some of the mistakes that they they make when trying to scale the 50, the, you know, 50 to 100K a month or even 20, 30, 50 to 100K a month? They lack financial literacy. Um, that's a huge one. And so a lot of the, we have a lot of really good marketers in our space, which is awesome, but also sucks because you're getting like the best of the best people like coming after you and all the money that you just made. Yeah. So a lot of coaches make that first 10 and 20 K months and they're being fed. this like, you need to invest. You need to reinvest to like, keep going. You need to like put profits back in the business. You need to, and like, that's all good advice. Mm-hmm. The problem is like, you don't need to reinvest $20,000 into like an ads agency to run ads for you. Yeah. If you just had your first 10 K month. Yeah. Um, so a lot of them get shiny object syndrome and they, they massively reinvest in the wrong areas. You know, I had a coach who, she made $50,000 and so she was one of our best case studies. She went from zero and never run a coaching business before month six, she hit $50,000. It was the most rapid rise for fame I'd ever seen. She was a killer when it came to marketing. Um, but the minute she had that money, she was like, I have to reinvest in other stuff. And she bought into this idea that she needs to just have an app. And then, and then she bought into a massive sales team for that app. She burned through all the 50,000 in the following two months, completely ditched the model that got her there and went back to zero. Mm. It's been two years now and the app still hasn't launched. Wow. And so I think that the biggest mistake that I see is, is coaches will make the money then immediately be like, I need to spend this on something else. When a lot of times it's like, you need to be patient. Mm-hmm. You need to learn how to let that money sit in your account. And I think a lot of this comes back to like mindset where it's like, you're worthy of having that money in your account. Don't try to just get rid of it. A lot of them get scared. And they're like, I've never had this much money before. Something deep inside of me, some money mindset issues are telling me I'm not worthy of holding this. So I need to just give it away now. And if I give it away to some place that's promising, they'll make me more, at least I'll feel good about it. Mm-hmm. But they're not comfortable just sitting and watching their account go to 20K, 50K, $100,000. It scares them. Mm-hmm. So I think the best advice I could ever give a fitness coach who's starting to see success is like, just keep doing what you're doing until that stops working and be patient. Yeah. You'll be surprised at how far it'll go. Mm-hmm. You might have like a 10K month and then another 10K month. That's not a loss. That is really good. You're sustaining 10K months. Then you have a 12 and a 15. A year later, you're doing the same thing. You might be a 30 and you're going to be like, oh, wow, I didn't, I didn't actually add in anything. I was just patient. And now you've been profiting all of that. You have $100,000 in your bank account. You've changed the trajectory of your financial future forever in 12 months just by not panicking and dishing it into some random thing. I think uh, a big problem that I see is that fitness coaches will go six months in, they'll have these big months and then they'll get bored, yeah. right? They, they're doing outreach, they're doing the daily work. And that first six month process is really fun and exciting for them because they're learning all these new things and it's working for them and they're making this money that's you know good for the first time. And then six, another six months go by, they're making, you know, it's, it's kind of, it becomes mundane almost like the daily work becomes mundane. And so they, they're looking for something to shake things up where it's like, no, keep doing what you're doing, systemize what you're doing, and then go focus on other areas of your life. Like go develop new skills in other areas, go become a better coach, go join other mentorships that are outside of 
you know, the fitness space, go travel, go like take your mind off of the daily mundane because I feel like when they get so focused on the daily work, because like, I'm sure you've probably experienced this too. Like the things I do on a daily day-to-day basis haven't really changed in the last year. Yeah. It's the same stuff that keeps working. I put money away and I invest it. My account grows, but I'm really focused on like, dude, I like, I enjoy making content. So I'm going to focus on that. I just started reading the Harry Potter series. So like on Friday we had a 10 K day, dude, I read Harry Potter the entire day. It was, <laughs> and so many people would feel so guilty about that. I feel like we have like this ingrained belief in our society that if you're not hustling and productive and, and working all a day, 24 seven, then you're not doing enough. Yeah. When those same coaches that feel like they're not doing a month, just hit a 50 K month took home 20, 30 K in profit. And they're depressed because they don't feel like they're moving fast enough. It's like, dude, go enjoy your life, man. Yeah. I think social media has done a really good job of giving us a complete misrepresentation of like what wealth looks like. Yeah. And we buy into this idea that it has to be more and more and more. And like you said, it becomes very one faceted. And I think that too, it's like, if you have an addictive personality, like there is an insane dopamine hit to like making sales. Mm -hmm. But the problem is like, I remember the first time I made a sale for an online package, I sold a $700 three month package. Dude, I was like running up and down my apartment screaming. Mm -hmm. Like I was like on cloud nine. I think I went out and probably bought like a hundred dollar steak. I spent like a hundred of it on a steak that night. I was like, we did it. We're selling online stuff, like freaking out. And nowadays, like, you know, some of our packages are, you know, I've had hack users with high 36K for like our very, very top stuff, you know, that I've sold in a day and it, it doesn't hit the same way it does. And so people, I think if you get addicted to the process, you do become numb to it. Yeah. Yeah. You will keep either searching for like a bigger high quote unquote, of like selling a bigger product, signing a larger contract. Um, and if you don't get a healthy mix in your life, like you said, of like, I get the same enjoyment out of reading my book, having a 10K day going on a date with my wife, um, uh, investing in, you know, some new course to like better my mobility or better my like gut health yep. and like getting excited about that. If it's all just in this one area, you will get bored and you will get antsy and you'll want to make things go faster because you are, you're demanding that that one aspect of your life bring you all your joy and fulfillment. And when that's not how it's meant to be. And so you'll just squeeze it dry and then you'll make mistakes in it. Whereas if you understand like that is meant to be 20, 30% of my life. What's it's good, it's yeah. good. Leave it alone. Yeah, leave it, it alone. Go focus on these other yeah. things. Yeah. And so I think that's hard too because a lot of times you you have to, in some sense, lose that balance to mm-hmm. get going. Yeah. But then you have to regain that balance mm-hmm. and keep going. What What do you think are some of the best investments fitness coaches can make once they get to the 10 to 15K mark? Yeah. I think number one's a setter. I think if you have a good setter, someone who don't go to an agency and like buy someone for a lot of money, but like, Find someone who's willing to, you know, work, wants to learn from you, train them in-house. That buys back the biggest, I think, burnout piece for coaches, which is the messaging. Mm-hmm. If you kind of know in the back of your head, I've got someone ready to start a conversation, book calls for me, um, just help me with my account. One, you're gonna be inspired to make more content because you're like, okay, cool. Someone's sitting there now waiting for all any content that I make, any leads that that brings in, they're sitting there waiting. And they're kind of getting mad at me if I'm not doing stuff to give them work because mm-hmm. that's how they make their money. And two, you're like, now any kind of mental block between you creating leads and having to message them is gone because it's not you doing that. And you still have to, again, 30, like three months to like four months to train this person on board them. You're doing twice the work. You are teaching them how to do what you're doing while you're doing what you're doing still. But that right there, I think I've seen it for most of our coaches. That's what gives them their, their time back. And it kind of relates that spark because a lot of the resistance become I don't want to make content that gets me more leads because I'm so sick of having the same conversations in the DMs over and over again. Yeah. yeah. And so having the setter is the first piece. Um, and then from the setter, depending on your strong suit, it's either then investing in an assistant coach to help you with fulfillment. If you have a lower, let's say you have a lower price point and you're just pushing people in like crazy, you have a 60, 70% close rate, like everyone's saying yes to it, that's affordable and it's a good program. Hire an assistant coach who can help you. And then that opens your roster side. If you can handle 60 to 80 people on your own, now you can handle, you know, 160 people. And so you're wide open. There's no bottle cap on your growth. And then lastly, the class piece that I hire out is a closer. Yeah. Right. Once you have all of that, you can still do all of that organically. You don't need mm-hmm. to run ads yet or anything. All of that is like the first pieces I would invest in. Um, and then kind of once you have a structure like that, then you want to buy a CRM. You would yeah. get a CRM set up to be like, okay, cool. Let's, go, let's all get on the same platform where we all can see like the messages, all the applications, all the client data. It's all in one spot for us. That's kind of the, the main investment 
uh, categories that I would put our coaches through. And then anything else outside of that, if I didn't say it, trust me, you don't need it. Like, yeah. You just, anything yeah. else that you're like, oh, what about this? You don't need Do it. Do these pieces first yeah. and then we can talk about that. Yeah. Let's uh, switch gears. Let's talk about, you know, finance and investing. What are your thoughts on investing, not just in the business, but just like, you know, in retirement? I'm really like, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of context. When I was in high school, the very first book that I read that wasn't Harry Potter was uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And that was when I first got introduced to the idea of investing that led me into, you know, uh, stock investing. Crypto wasn't really a thing back then. Um, and so I became obsessed with investing in index funds. I was like, I need to take the $25 a week that I make mowing lawns and invest it into index funds. And then I was like, wait, I'm going to retire at 180 at this rate. I need more money to invest. How can I make more money? I don't ha like, I, I, I'm too young for a job. So let me go work. Let me go figure out a way to start making money. That got me into entrepreneurship. So entrepreneurship, uh, wasn't just a, how do I say it? Uh, was it just a necessity, but it was always a means to an end for me to invest more because I get a lot of, uh, I very security driven guy. Yeah. Like I love having security. I didn't have the security for my parents that I needed because I wasn't going to go get a job. So I needed to make my own security. So I, I learned a lot about investing. Entrepreneurship became a means to an end for me to make more so that I can invest more. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, do you and Maria invest? Where, what are your beliefs on investing? Are you into real estate? Are you into index funds, crypto? What, what are your thoughts there? Yeah. I, I, um, so I came similar background with finance, the only investing side, I had the background in finance and like a bunch of all the classes I took that I can for electives were like investment based. So I got really into like how to build a portfolio. The internship I took was for a um, a wealth management firm and I like managed like their tax loss selling and stuff. So I got really into like, what did it look like to have portfolios, manage wealth? Um, it really opened my eyes to like, oh, when you have money, it doesn't do anything unless you you put it to work. And if you put it to work, like you will like double, triple, quadruple your, your money depending on when you put it in. Um, but I also saw like there's there's so much like quick try to get rich quick stuff that I was like I, I try to keep that on my business side where I'm like I will take all my risky investments on my own business because you will never get a better return on investment than by investing in your own business or mm -hmm. scaling like even like the ads we do if you look at like the ads like some months you'll have like a 16 x row ads and you're like you can't put any money anywhere right now where you'll get a 16 x return on it in 30 days yeah like, that's like it's unheard of so what I do is I kind of partition it where I'm like I want majority of my money going back into the business because I'm forcing growth at a young age, I can take that high risk. And I think of my business as its own asset in my portfolio that I'm investing in heavily, mm -hmm. but I'll still take 15, 20% and I'll set it aside into just index mutual funds mm -hmm. where it's very much like, these are things that I will never touch again. I'll just, I'm going to put it here. I'm going to hold them with a Roth IRA, um, just tax protected and let that grow for that security piece. I'm definitely less risk averse. I'm, I'm fine to like push heavy. So like I reinvest most of the stuff back into the business to scale. Um, I, I invest like heavily, I'm invested in Cole Gordon's program mm -hmm. in the boardroom, it's not cheap. Um, yeah. I did Daniel Isles and Viral Coach, which again is a like massive ticket price, but was like super valuable. So I invest a lot of my money into educational stuff, which is an intangible. Um, and then, you know, reinvesting into ads, which we can kind of track the ROI on not huge on like crypto or any of that stuff. I, I, I've done some crypto investing and most of it's kind of similar to day trading at this point where you're, you're kind of just guessing. Um, so I park a little bit in like Ethereum and Bit, and then I have most of my stuff parked in index funds. And it's really for me, it's a set it and forget it thing. Yep. And then I think once the business becomes more of a cash cow, um, where it's doing like, you know, multiple hundreds of thousands of month, like getting closer to like hopefully one day closer to like a million a month, I want to use that to get massively into real estate. Mm -hmm. Every person I've met, because um, there's a lot of good connections in Irish County, most of the people I've met who have been really good mentors to me, they're all from the real estate space. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's a, it's a different level of money. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it kind of opened my eyes. So I was like, oh, dude, like I felt like Harmozy and like the 100 million was like crazy. And I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. These yeah. guys have b just billions of dollars in their portfolios through commercial real estate and all this. And they'll just kind of tell me like, yeah, when you have money, like this is the first thing you can do. Like you could take a business that makes a couple million a year if you use that to buy into the real estate game, it's like a whole different chessboard that you're on now, but you're adding like two to three zeros, like what we think is like massive now in our 20s. So it's very cool. So I definitely want to get into real estate. I'm not in real estate by any means at this time, but I want to get into real estate once I've kind of built this company to hopefully, you know, I want to get 
full-time like an eight-figure company at some point. So that's kind of the goal is once it's at eight-figure, then I'm going to get into real estate very heavily. But on the investing side, I just put aside like 15, 20%. I, just, I try not to look at it. Yeah. I, uh, I did a lot of front loading on my portfolio. Um, my portfolio right now, I mean, it's not huge, but if I crunch the numbers, do the math, me and Megan are already set yeah, yeah. for like, if we wanted to retire at 65, we're good. Like we don't need a, like we're, 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 we're set. Um, and now it's just like, okay, the more money that I put into it now, it just means the earlier we get to yeah, retire, the like higher quality of life. Dude, if we could retire at 45, like dude, I'm chilling. I, I feel like I don't need much. I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't, if for me, my magic number, I feel like everyone has a magic number. My magic number is 10 million. And if I could retire on 300 K a year, keep my living expenses low, that, and just be a dad, yeah. be a husband, you know, give more time back to my parents. For me, that's, that's the end goal. That's the dream. Dude, that's, I'm sure a bunch of people hear that and be like, retire on 300K a year. Like, heck yeah. It's like, you have to think it out. Like, it's, it's probably really realistic. I like that number too. I, 10 million is my number for full time, where it's like, I want to get it to a 10 million per year run rate. Right? Good. And so, yeah, I think that's, I think there's just a comfort in that too, where like you said, you're a big security guy. I think half of it is like, you can activate better in your like zone of genius if you are eliminating factors that pull you out of that zone of genius. So like, your zone of genius is like your pure, unadulterated, just flow. And when you're feeling scarcity, or you're feeling lack, like it pulls you from that and you make decisions out of scarcity or lack versus scare, like decisions out of just pure passion for what you do and unadulterated by like any kind of, uh, any kind of lack or scarcity. And so what I, when you set yourself up in that way where you're like, I know regardless of what I do now, we're set mm. and like nothing that happens here is going to affect that. I feel like it almost allows you to, to create in a way that most other people can't and it kind of sharpens you into this tool that can can do things that other people just that they can't yeah that was my benchmark for getting a corvette i drove my honda civic into the ground yeah. and i was like dude you could afford this you could afford that but it wasn't until i hit that mark where i was like hey we're good i can i can afford to buy this car for and make the payments on it for the next couple months because i know i we're, we're already good like i don't i'm we're not losing money down that um but to switch things up, what are some things outside of business that you want to accomplish in life? Do you want to write a book? Is there any big trips that you look forward to taking? Is there anything that you want to do, you know, outside of business? Yeah, I would say definitely. I have a book. I have a title for it already. Oh, really? Yeah. What, 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 what do you want to put in it? Um, so it's going to be a book. It's called The Human Element. Okay. I've been writing it for years. Um, and so eventually I want, to, I want to piece it together. I feel like I want more life experience. So it kind of is like not an autobiography. But it's a little mix of like my philosophy on life mixed into like my experiences. So I want to write that one day as having kind of a passion project. Um, so that's definitely something I want to do. Also, I'm a big surfer. So mm -hmm. I want to surf um, Chupu, which is like in the Venetian Islands. And it's like this mad, it's like the Mount Everest of surfing. So it takes a lot of training. It's a larger wave. So you need to like do a lot of breath training and practice. And you actually get towed into it on a ski. Oh, big, yeah. big, big wings. And so I'm like, I want to do that one day. Like, I want to be able to say I surfed it before I die. It's like, that's like another big one on my bucket list. I'm okay. like, when I get my 40s and something, I'll have my midlife crisis and be like, all right, this is the time. time. I got to do this now. Yeah. So um, yeah, I'd say that's a big one. The book. Um, and then you just kind of traveling the world with Ellie. Yeah. Like the minute you have kids, everything becomes new again. You're like, okay, I've been to these places but they haven't. So yeah. I want to take them. I want to show them the world and just be able to create memories. Like I want to be remembered as like the dad and the grandpa who like created all these memories for his mm -hmm. kids. Um, so you know, being able to like buy a beach house at the beach place that we used to go to and like have my kids there and create just a full childhood full of memories for them and the grandkids. Like that to me is kind of like, that's like the big piece of my bucket list. I love it. What, let's talk about the book. Is this something that you're currently writing? Is this something that is like an idea that you're kind of forming, like the things and not thoughts and ideas that, but and what do you, what are some big lessons that you think are important that you want to put in there? Yeah. So it's, um, it's definitely more of just a lot of excerpts that I kind of have that I'm going to organize into a book, but it's kind of like my personal philosophy of life, kind of what I believe you know, a grand like life meaning of things, very similar in styles like a Dan Coe who wrote, um, just recently wrote his book, uh, The Art of Focus, uh, kind of like how he believes you should, uh, what the meaning of life is, how this all works. Um, it's obviously for me, I'm like, I want way more life experience before I, you know, I don't want to be the 20 year old who like releases a book. I'm like, here's the meaning of life, like in my twenties. Um, but I'm slowly piecing together pieces of it, which will probably be chapters in it. Um, and I, I have a lot of it written out, but I, 
Yeah, I, I'm big on philosophy. Like I love philosophy. I've studied um, when I was in college. I studied abroad for a semester. I took all philosophy classes, and so I studied like all these. Um, I'm like Nietzsche to like a lot of the Catholic saints and church um, writers that just of all these different philosophies of life. I got really into it. I loved it. I was like, I'm super passionate about this. I'm like, there's like no way to monetize this or anything, but I'm like, it's just in my free time. I really enjoy that. I read a bunch of this stuff that I kind of infuse it into your own uh, personal journal writing and stuff. Yeah. I'm kind of like, okay, cool. How does this relate to like what I'm experiencing nowadays? I think that's the most powerful thing is like philosophy tend to stay the same. People just lose the ability to understand them because it's, it's so different in today's modern culture. And so be able to take these philosophies and be like, here's how I experience them in the modern culture. Here's how it helped me find some success in this world and some sense of meaning. I think will be a fun thing to kind of write. Yeah. I, uh, I wrote a book when I was 24 and it was the most fulfilling project I've ever done. Yeah. I made no money from it. Yeah. I, I really, what we use it for is we give it to our students when they sign up as a free gift. Um, but I'm so excited to one day write another, but like you said, I feel like I need to get a couple more years on <laughs> my belt, get a, get a, a few more punches in the face so I can have some learning lessons that, to yeah. share. The punches will help. I have a couple of good stories of like, oh man, like I really learned my lesson on yeah. that one. This will be a fun one to share. Well, we'll, we'll have to save it for another podcast, man. Thumbs up. Uh, well, thank you so much for coming out. I know that you drove out here uh, on business. You made the time to come out on a Sunday morning to hop on this. So dude, I appreciate you, man. Dude, I'm super happy to be here. Thank you so much for opening up your doors today. Of course, man. Well, uh, what are some final thoughts that you'd like to uh, leave for the listeners, the audience, someone who is looking into the entrepreneur dream, the kind of, you know, testing out whether or not it's for them. But what would you say? Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing better than just go for it. Give yourself time. Don't buy into this fact that anything has to happen in the next 30, 60, 90 days. Just decide you're going to try this for a year, maybe in conjunction with what you're already doing for a full-time job. Um, But give it an honest try. And I think you'll be surprised at how successful it can be. Success isn't earned quickly it's earned through consistency and so if you just set yourself up the expectation of i'm going to try something for 365 days and if it doesn't work well at least i gave it a shot i've never had someone who committed to that and not ended up becoming successful so if you're thinking of trying that's how i would approach it perfect awesome man